thank you all for joining us. I was just thinking about what, when did we start? It was 2021. We're in 23 right now. And I'm pretty sure we also started in the beginning of November. So right now we're at the end of October. It really kind of works out. It was almost exactly two years. Uh, here's Bob also. Bob Mohan. And, uh, and Nelson. Okay, so yeah, we got a lot of people here tonight. Wow, this is probably our most uh, well-attended class so far. <laughs> so uh, everyone's got to slide in at the last moment, I guess, you know. <laughs> so slide into home. Um, all right. Uh, so the last thing we've been doing, we, we, we discussed, we are at the end of the 12th chapter, obviously, last chapter of the book, last verses of the book. Um, and we've been just going through his kind of look at this as his epilogue, right? So this is his ending statements uh, about what we've learned throughout the entire book. Uh, and in fact, the main idea that he is bringing out in this epilogue <clears throat> is that the, the book itself is limited. It's a book. It can only tell you so many things. So 12 chapters is the discussion of all of wisdom, happiness, Right, the, all the all the things that we've looked into, that's gonna it's gonna be a guide, perhaps, but it's not going to be the the end all to be all. Right, it's not gonna tell you everything that you need to know. There's a an amount of uh, of personal input that a person has to put in beyond that, and there's amount there's a, there's a certain wisdom that's gonna be gained by reaching out to elders, reaching out to wise people, and continuing the process of study beyond what you're reading in the book itself. Make sense? So that's what we that's what we saw. We began to see in verse number thirteen, uh, verse number eleven. A couple of backwards here. Okay, so let's go. You know what? I almost forgot our first thing we always do. Always provide the link in the chat. I'm sorry, it's up to date. Okay, we have we have word that is officially up to date. Um, although I let me where's where's the chat? Oh, there's the chat. Okay. Uh, Okay, so if you'd like to review anything, catch up on anything, as I, as I just said, the word is word on the street is that we are up to date. All the, all the classes are on are on YouTube. If you'd like to start over the beginning, right, you can start over from there. So that will be available um, if you'd like to do so. Uh, all right, without any further ado, let's go to the share screen over here. And in person, we've got copies uh, available. Uh, and the actual, the copy, as you'll notice, in person, are do start from verse number 11. And there's a reason for that because Rabbi Diskin asked me at the last minute where to start from. I told him to start from 11. Uh, <laughs> that's the main reason. But actually, let's look at one more time because it was a it was a rough verse and it's going to lead us into verse number 12. So verse number 11, which is, again, the rough copies should be at the top of the page. Divrei chachamim kidar vonot. The words of the wise are like a, it's a type of spike that was in the, that they would, it was part of the um, the the yoke of a cow. It would help guide the cow as it's plowing in the right direction. I'm sorry. And like set nails are the words of those who gather, of the masters of gathering. Okay, and they're given from one source, from one uh, literally shepherd. Right, and the idea that we said last week, or last time we actually, I was sick last week, um, we were supposed to do this last week. So last time we met um, was the, 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 the idea that we said over here is that there's two different types of wise people. Okay, There are people who are inherently wise. They are chachamim. They are wise people in the fact that they're able to apply knowledge. They don't just have knowledge. They don't just gather knowledge, but they take the knowledge that they have, and they're able to apply it to new situations. So in that situation, in that type of wise person is like the darban, is like the special tool, this spike, which is actually removable. It can guide. You can use it to also turn the cow in different directions. These types of these type of wise people are able to take old information and reapply it and shift it and mold it to new situations. As opposed to balea supot, literally means people who just gather. So there's also other wise people who are there simply gatherers. They store old information, but they don't know what to, they don't necessarily have the skill to shift it and to apply it into something new. Okay. And so that's what we said. They are like set nails. They still guide you on the right track, but they can't take into account new circumstances, new, new, uh, new, new, uh, new uh, experiences. And however, both of these are 
coming from the same source, they come from the shepherd, which we said is, uh, according to the sages, is, is a veiled reference to Moses, that the uh, the words of the of all the wise come to us through the wisdom of the Torah. Okay, and that leads us now to verse number 12, the first of this week's verses. All right. Vioter mehema. And more than that, Bini, my son, he's a hair, you should be careful. Asot sefarim harbe, with the making of many books, ain kates to all to no number, to no to no end. Vilahag harbe yigiat basar is a very difficult word to, to figure out what this means. Lahag harbe yigiat basar, and lots of work is tiring to the to the flesh. Okay, so let's read that one more time. Again, kind of a funny verse. It says vioter mehema bini hizaher. More than that, my son, be careful. Asot Sfarim Harbe to make or from making, well, we'll discuss that in a second, many books, in case to no to no end, Vlag Harbe Yat Basar, and there's a lot of work that weakens, that that tires out the flesh. Okay. So there's a number of things to discuss over here to just see right off the bat. Uh, number one is the word hizaher. Okay. You should be careful. So th this word stood out to me. Uh, because if you actually look at a lot of the commentators over here, they say that it is incumbent upon a person to go ahead and write a lot of books. You should be careful to write books, okay? If a person has wisdom to share, they should share that with, with people. Um, however, I think it's important to point out that the word hizahar, the shoresh, the root over there is zayin, hey, resh, uh, zahar means to be careful from something, meaning to be wary of something. All right. It doesn't mean to be careful to do something. It means to be careful for, to be wary from something. So with that understanding, I think we have to relook at this verse over here and, and kind of try to figure out the word he's a hair should not mean be careful to write books, be careful to share knowledge. It should be it should be be careful from writing books and from all the books that are written. Um, so I think that changes the, the, the sense of the verse over here. Again, different commentators are going from different directions, but I do think that there's uh, something to be said for that choice of words over there. And also there's almost this, uh, uh, in the way he writes the next line, Svarim Harbei in Kate, an innumerable amount of books, right? It almost seems like he's dismissing this as 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 kind of a, 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 a almost a silly idea. Now it's not, obviously we are, if any uh, religion is going to be telling you that books are important, I think it would be ours, right? We seem to have a lot of them, <laughs> uh, but I think he is he is he is harping on a on a an important point in the discussion of where to continue and further your study of knowledge. Okay, we've been looking for wisdom, and he just told us in the verse before that there's different types of wise people. Make sure you choose the right one for the right situation. Sometimes you just need to be guided guided by the old wisdom. And that's fine. And there's wise people for that. And sometimes you need something else. Sometimes you need a wise person who's wise enough to apply information to a new situation and to change and to shift directions. Um, in the same sense over here, I think he's saying that there are a lot of books. He doesn't say la asot svarim parbe. He doesn't say to make many books or from making many books. So it actually, that would work in both translations of his hair. Uh, both senses of the word, but it says asot, the fact that there is made svarim harbe many books. Okay, so it seems to be what at least what he's saying to me is, don't rely only on the books. Okay, the books serve a purpose; they absolutely serve a purpose. There's so much thing, so much information and important information that is brought is given over through the libraries of books. The wise person is not going to rely simply on that knowledge. The wise person is going to go ahead and apply something else to the process, and apply personal logic, is going to reach out to people who are wiser than themselves and to um, and, and to to go beyond the book, if you will, right? To 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 see what's written, but also to add on to it and to think about it, to not just be a receptacle of words that are written in book form, mm -hmm. but in, in fact to uh to to go beyond that. I once heard a a, a great um a great line from a comedian. He said, I'm the type of guy who learned social skills from books written by people who learned social skills from books. 
you know, <laughs> it was, so, uh, you know, there is, there is that type of idea that there, something cannot be given, not everything can be given over in a book form. Very good. Steve just pointed out, Steve, Steve's here in person. He just pointed out that there's, it, it would seem to be an interesting co connection between the two types of Torah itself. Torah is given over in two forms. We have a written Torah of which Kohelet, Kohelet is part, but we also have a oral, an oral tradition, an oral Torah, which includes the Gemara, the Midrash, the, all, all those sorts of things. On this verse, the sages say that we have to be extremely careful with the words of the sages. Good thing for the sages to say, right? The sages say it's important to, have, to be very careful with the words of the sages because their words are actually more important, so to speak, than the words of the Torah itself. The Torah is because the Torah is a limited document. It's a document. There's only so much that can be written in 24 books of the Tanakh. There's only so much information that can be written in all the many prophets, that, but it's limited. It's going to be, it's a written document. It's got a limit to how much it's going to be able to express. So the words of the sages are a line, and they, they're a, 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 um, a tradition that adds on and adds on and adds on more and more into the understanding of 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 the um, of the Torah itself. So it, perfect perfect connection because that's actually where I was going. <laughs> that the, the the sages' interpretation of this verse, in fact, ties in with what I think the verse is saying based on our understanding of what the verse is saying, it's be careful not to just rely on the fact that there's Asot, Sorim, Harbe, and Kates, that there's, oh, there's an innumerable amount of books. I'll find all the information I need from there. No, we have to put it aside time to work and to think and to understand what's going on, what we can add, what we our teachers tell us, what's beyond the books themselves. And that's the end of the verse over here is Valahag Harbe, Yikiyat Basar, Lahag, um, for for Myra especially, I think you'll appreciate this. Lahag has no uh, no no companion in all of Tanakh, according to the uh, the the, uh, uh, the uh, many of the uh, commentators over here. That it does not exist anywhere else. So whenever you're stuck with a word that has no that doesn't exist anywhere else, we have to kind of just figure out what's going on. Um, so uh, most of the commentators over here, and in fact the sages also, they seem to interpret Lahag as being some sort of term referring to hard work, to delving into something at, at length. Uh, there is a word in Hebrew, lahagot, uh, the he, the lamed, I'm sorry, would not belong, was not part of the shoresh, it's not part of the root. So hag would be the, uh, would be the, uh, the shoresh, would be the root, and that hag means to go in depth, lahagot, the hegita bo yom, yom v'layla, <clears throat> that the Torah is expected to, we're expected to delve into a day and night. So that would be the <clears throat> the closest connection to the word lahag. Um, I also saw one of the commentators points out that if anyone's paying attention during the middle of Yom Kippur, uh, in one of the many many poems we read, it says that the uh, the, the angels are belahag melahagim. They praise God with this lahag. So it's apparently a word that's known elsewhere, but it it, it doesn't exist anywhere else in Tanakh, at least. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the the in depth learning, in context, the in depth learning of the books will tire a person out if they spend all their time specifically in studying the books but applying no heart and no no no, no personal input. It's going to tire you out to just become a library, a walking library. is something that not your average person is not going to be able to do. Uh, Yigia, uh, that last second to last word over there is tiredness uh, we find that by um by the uh, by when the amalek attacks the jewish people it says that they were ayef via they were we weakened and tired all right so yagea uh, typically means tired uh it is i believe the the vilna gaon says that the difference between ayef and yagea is ayef is when you're just tired because you haven't had enough sleep and yagea is when you're tired you're weak you're 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 pooped. You're just you work so hard that you can't. You don't have any 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 energy left. So that would admit, fit over here also very well. That the idea is that spending too much time in this one area, this one area of books, and not applying any personal anything from yourself would tire a person out and leave them wanting more. <laughs> um, so that is really, if anything, that seems to be the final 
the final lesson of this epilogue, okay? The epilogue being how do we expand our knowledge beyond the study of the Ko of Kohelet itself? We're going to go and not rely on books. We're going to reach out to the wise people. We're going to add on from our own knowledge and add on from our own logic and expand it beyond what we have just simply in the book. And that's obvious. I mean, we've we've sat here now for two years reading a, a safer, reading a book that has so many interpretations. And so if you were to just rely on the reading of Kohelet, especially our, our interpretation of Kohelet has been uh, empowering. That's been the goal from day one, is to be an empowering reading of the, of the book of Kohelet as opposed to a depressing reading of the book of Kohelet, which is very easy to do, right? So if we were to just give the Kohelet class from the depressing point of view, if we were to just read the book as it was, we would not have had all the things we got for over the past two years, right? So it's a it's a it's a work to go ahead and try and take the book and expand it beyond what's in the simple reading. So again, another idea that that comes out when we're when we are stuck in the words of the, in the just in the text itself, we can have one understanding, but when we add on our own logic, our own knowledge, our own input from other people, then it expands to something even bigger, and it doesn't doesn't tire us out the same. Okay, so that leads us to verse number 13, probably the most famous verse in all of Kohelet. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> and this is Sof Davar HaKol Nishma. The end of everything. The end of the matter is that everything is heard. Et HaElokim Yira. God is feared. Vet Mitzvot Tav Shemor. And his commandments are kept. Ki Kol HaAdam. Because that is all of mankind, or that that is the the entirety of the person. Okay, we'll discuss exactly what the kol ha'adam is in a, in, a, in a minute here. So let's read that again one more time. Sof davar, the end of everything, the culmination of everything, is hakol nishma. Everything is heard. Et elokim yira, God is feared. Vet mitzvotav shemor, his his commandments are kept, are guarded. Kizek kol ha'adam, because that is the culmination that is the entirety of mankind or of the man the man let's just say um so there's two things grammatically that kind of stand out to me in this verse uh number one is the large samich uh, if you're on the screen you can see that probably pretty clearly uh but probably also on the paper form i'm assuming it's there the letter samich of the first of the first word sof is enlarged um i i just perceive that as being a sign that this is this is the really the the finality of all the finales, right? This is last paragraph, you know, author's end note. Um, so we've had a lot of kind of conclusion followed by an epilogue, followed by this is the this is the jacket cover, you know, this is the end of everything. Um, the other grammatical thing is that the word is in passive tense. So hakol nishma, everything is heard. Etelokim yira, God is feared. At mitzvot shemor and his Commandments are kept, okay? It does not say that all of mankind is to listen is or is to have things heard and to fear God and to keep the mitzvot. It is that they are they already happen. They will happen no matter what. Um, that's interesting. I don't necessarily have an explanation of why that is. It just kind of stands out to me that the entire verse is in a passive tense. It is happening. Um, it is happening. It's present passive, right? Yes. Okay, present passive. So, so it's not past tense. It's not that the words of God, the words are heard, were heard. It is that they are currently being heard passively. <laughs> so that could be one way to read it. I'm not going to go with that way, but I hear uh, Steve -O again is uh, offering that it could be an, a, a this could be a, a slightly depressing idea that no matter what you do, you know, there's somebody else pulling the strings. What was it? I remember my dad showed me a movie many years ago, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, right? For with um, what's his name? What? No, no, no. no it's no. Uh, Danny K. Danny K. Danny K. Right. And there's a there's a there's a uh, a scene in there. He's a he has a bunch of these dream scenes, right? And one of the dream scenes or or imagination scenes or something like that. And there's a puppet, and there's the the, the refrain is uh, 
Hope oh, the puppet can do anything as long as somebody else is pulling the strings, right? So yes, you could kind of read this verse as like there's a puppet master, master of puppets who's uh, pulling all the strings and making sure everything happens. And there's no doubt that that's true, <laughs> right? We definitely believe that that is the case. God is definitely pulling the strings. The way I I understand this verse is that we've discussed the entire book of Kohelet has been a discussion of this worldly things. It, there was consistently over and over and over again, a reference to tachat hashamash, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun, from, from chapter one all the way through the very end. It was always a discussion of this world, which was the per point of the book. The point of the book, book is to provide you with a path towards happiness in this world, to find wisdom in this world. But would King Solomon be King Solomon if he didn't go ahead and then at some point, at some time, discuss the spiritual? You know, it has to build, it has to exist too, and I think that's what he's doing over here. In the last moments, he's coming in and explaining to you that I have given you a path for this world, but there is something spiritual too to focus on. There's something also spiritual that we have to spend our time thinking on, and that's gonna kind of take you beyond the book to to, to your next steps. Uh, so the end of the matter is that everything is heard, that God is feared, that His commandments are kept. So in other words. There is also expectations. There's spiritual expectations. The wise person does not stop at this world and say, okay, I got wisdom. I got happiness. I'm good to go. There is also another world. There's another uh, another dimension to live beyond this world and, and, and to go into. Um, earlier this week, uh, Aki Fleschler, who's not part of this class, but he, he, he gave me a book, a, a gift. Um, it's a book on Kohelet. And it's a it's, it, it, addressing Kohelet from the perspective of King Solomon himself, his own life story. So it's very interesting to, I've been mean, reading through it the past couple of days, and it's very interesting because King Solomon himself is a little bit of a, a funny character in Tanakh. I'm sorry? Right. Oh, sorry. The book is called, um, it's called Kohelet. There's a tagline. It's by David Kerwain. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yes. Um, by David Kerwin. I think it's David Kerwin. Um, yeah. So, uh, and so what he says is he points out the fact that King Solomon himself is a bit of a bit of an interesting character in the fact that he's highly spiritual, right? He's guided by wisdom. He's got this intense, passionate connection with God in his youth, but as he grows older and older, he seems to lose pieces of that to the point where at least according to the a strict reading of the text, it would seem that he is serving idol, idols at the end of his life. Now, the sages jump in and they say, no, 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 King Solomon never served idols. It was his wives. It was the fact that he didn't stop them. He, you know, he had a thousand wives from all different cultures. And the fact that he didn't stop them, and it wasn't his fault, or, or it was called by his name because he should have done something like that. Okay, that's, that's definitely, you know, that's the sages' interpretation. That's definitely the truth. There's no question about that. But the verse words it in that way for a purpose to tell you that there was something lost. There was love lost at the end of his life that wasn't there that he had in his youth. So his whole life story is actually the experience of being super intensely, emotionally, passionately connected to God and losing that along the way and coming. This author, at least, is expressing this idea that he's coming at the end of his life with Kohelet to try and recapture some of that. Of that emotion. Very interesting thesis, I, I think. Um, so I'm kind of reading that right now. But it would make sense that here, after all this discussion, all the the what was Kohelet filled with? It was filled with with we went this direction and that direction. It had it had. Uh, uh, let's see, I, I kind of listed over here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Um, everything in Kohelet has been discussed. We've got political intrigue, right? We've got the, the young king, the old king. We've got the sadness, joy, despair. We've got every, all these different ideas showing up in the book of Kohelet. It's taken us on a lot of different I, places, but it's all been here in this world. It's all been here in, in the world of physicality. And so now he's telling us that there's something beyond that. There's a world of, of wisdom 
and a world of happiness that's, that goes beyond the physical realm. So he tells us that there's three things that happen. Number one is everything is listened to. Uh, number two is God is God is feared. And number three is that his commandments are kept. Uh, I think this itself is, is its own kind of lesson. When something is heard, that means it's expressed on the outside. It's not necessarily felt on the inside. So if I say something, it means that that's something I want you to think that I think. It's a, it means that I want you to think something about me. So King Solomon tells us, number one, everything is heard. All right. So what you the way you act, the way you present yourself is heard by God, is heard by the people around you, is heard by the world. Uh, everything is heard the way you express yourself. But that doesn't say anything about what's actually inside your soul. What does say something about what's inside your soul? That's the next line. That's when God is feared. Right. If the fear of God is actually inside of a person and fear is obviously it's not a great translation. We use the term fear of God. Fear is not, you know, shivering, shaking your boots out of, you know, he might punish me. There is that, but that's not really what we mean by uh, the fear of God, All right? When there's a personal... So, so, Rabbi, what do we mean then? I'm sorry? What do we mean? So, we mean, we mean, a, uh, uh, thank you, Jacob just asked, what do we mean if it's not, uh, you know, shaking in your boots, fear of God? Um, uh, my, it, it's awe, so, right, so uh, Jules just pointed out, yeah, it, part of it's awe. Right, there's an awe of God, um, but there's also a a feeling of responsibility to God, right? So people are fearful of their parents. Now, hopefully, they're not fearful that they're going to get hit by their parents. That can happen too. But when a little kid is fearful that their parents will, you know, don't tell my parents, because more than anything, they're afraid that they're going to disappoint their parents, right? The power of disappointment. Uh, I actually read it recently, a uh, a, a um, uh, a academic paper that was arguing that disappointment is a, is a lost art uh, and that it's actually a great motivator. Uh, and unfortunately, people don't know how to use it or don't use it anymore. Um, so disappointment is actually, so I would believe that we could we could just stop there, I guess, that until the Kimi Ram means that God is feared and meaning that from our perspective, we are looking towards not disappointing God. Okay. It's true. Right. That's true. Alan Lurie is here in, in person. He he pointed out also that there's a kind of a, a connection between Yira, meaning fear, and Lirot, to, to see or to be seen, that there's kind of this connection also that to, to fear something is the fear of being seen by that by that entity uh in a in a in an unfavorable light in a certain sense i think that's a really good connection um so here we have on one side we've got the outside we've got the hakol nishma everything is heard that's how i present myself to the world but that says nothing about my insides the insides is that the kimura is that god is fear on the insides in on my insides so there's that's the inside and the outside the 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 almost like a yin yin yin, yin yang that that the, the goal is really to reach a point where the inside and the outside match. There's this idea that when in the times of the Talmud, actually the times of the Mishnah, there was a period of time where um, one of the rabbis did not let anybody into the school unless they were toho kibaro, unless their insides matched their outsides. Okay, So they had to not just look religious and, and, and spiritual, but they had to see inside them, and I guess they had some sort of spiritual sight, they were able to see inside them and see if they were was it on the inside too? So at Elokim Yira was in addition to a Kol Nishma at Elokim Yira, and finally, and this is pro pro probably the most important one for your practical everyday experience. Experience as Et Mitzvotav Shemor is how do the two things combine in the sense of when my outside outward expressions reflect my inside fear of God, that is Shmirat Mitzvot, that is keeping the commandments of God. Again, something that King Solomon himself struggled with the three the three commandments that a king is told to do not to have too many horses not to have too many wives not to have too much money were the three things that he broke right so he himself understands this dichotomy of trying to be a spiritual uh, godly person but also struggling with the with the actual demands of god himself when you have all three of these together which is really the third one is the two other two together 
uh, that creates something that we haven't, I don't think we've seen at all yet. I'd have to look back to the rest of the book, whether we've had kol ha'adam. So we've had adam, 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 it comes up consistently. In fact, in this other book that I was reading, it said that the only two places where the word adam shows up so often is the beginning of Genesis and Kohelet. It's the only time that the word adam shows up this often. The, in Genesis, makes sense. He's kind of the main character at the beginning. And over here, we have Adam showing up consistently. It's a it's a book of trying to find your humanity. It's a book of trying to find that human, to fulfill those human needs. And here we're saying to go beyond the human and to try to fulfill the spiritual needs. That creates a kol ha'adam, the all of the human. Um, so that's almost like a, 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 it almost seems to me like a, like a, like a, an evolution to a new a new entity that we're now dealing with kol ha'adam kizeh kol ha'adam that makes up the entire person the entire uh, human being is when they have all three of those things and which leads us now to the final verse right this is verse number 14 again 12 14 uh ki et kol ma'aseha elokim sorry i i right off the bat i i, did, I put the comma in the wrong place ki et kol ma'aseh because all of the actions, ha'elokim yaviva v'mishpat, God will bring into judgment. Al kol na'alam, on all the hidden things, im tov v'imra, whether they be good or bad. Okay, let's read that one more time. Ki et kol ma'aseh, because all actions, ha'elokim yaviva v'mishpat, God will bring into ju into judgment. Al kol na'alam, for all the things that are forgotten, im tov v'imra, whether they are good or bad. Did you have something to say now? Oh, sorry. I thought you were mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, it that again, this verse on face value would be kind of like a wait, that's the end of the book that he's going to bring us to judgment. And in fact, when we read this in public in the uh in in the synagogue on uh on Sukkot, we review the the previous verse. We after we get to this verse, we read again verse number 13, Sofdavar Kol Nishma. So it kind of doesn't end off on the word ra doesn't we're end off of the word bad uh and that kind of like a sour taste but again obviously that's not what we're going to be looking for we're not we don't think i don't believe that this verse is a bad thing it's a, a very interesting thing he gives a qualification for that previous verse we're trying to create something that's also spiritual we're going trying to go beyond the physical and create something that's spiritual and additionally beyond let me read the word that again Beyond just trying to be physical beings and get the most out of the physical world, we're trying to create something spiritual too. And he wants to give a qualification. Why is that? Why should I be prompted to do this? Okay, so I'm, I'm sure you could find thousands of other books that discuss this at length. He gives us one, one verse. Why is it worthwhile for a person to go ahead and uh, work on the spiritual connection in addition to the physical connection, to the, to the connection to the, to the physical? And he wants to tell us a very interesting thing. He says that all the actions of a person are brought by God to judgment. Okay. Now we unfortunately we have a a negative view look on judgment. Okay. Judgment, we perceive it as judgment is a uh is something that we don't want to go through. We don't want to be judged. Uh we don't want to go stand in front of a, a, a judge in court. We, you know, and all the more so, would you want to go and 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 handle with you know be in touch with the judge who sees all the hidden things good and bad that that kind of that makes us take a step back but you find actually in in throughout the the books of tanakh that the idea of judgment is not necessarily a bad thing it's actually tends to be a good thing in fact there's an entire book of tanakh shoftim right there's the book of judges now these judges there were 11 of them and 10 of them were righteous people right and what do they do they go and they fight the wars for the jewish people they go and they battle the the uh the philistines you know they battle some people living you know in the case of shimshon they battle battle people in gaza right they uh they, they seem to have we seem to have a lot of history there um i'm sorry no never mind we don't we, we we're the occupiers my mistake um anyway um but yeah uh, we'll we'll leave that as the side for right now yeah. Yeah. Somebody's going to be watching this in, you know, 10 years, like, oh, was, oh, was something going on right then? Yeah. Okay. What? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. 
Um, so, but the idea is that a shofet is somebody who actually cares for the people. Um, the there's a verse in 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 Tehillim in Psalms that says In your ju- in your judgment, they all stand today, and they are all your servants. So to stand before somebody in judgment is not necessarily to be judged in the negative sense, but it means to have a connection with somebody. So when we, for example, when we approach God on Rosh Hashanah, we're not simply saying that he's judging us and we shall be scared and shaking in our boots. Again, there is an aspect of that, but that's not really the main idea. The main idea is that we present ourselves to God and say that we're we're part of this system. We want to be part of this. We we announce, we, we coronate God. We say we accept you as our king. Uh, so in that sense, also over here, I think the idea is not that God brings everything in judgment, you know, scary Charlton Heston God. I guess Charlton Heston was Moses, but not. <laughs> so, you know. But rather, I think it's it's that um, God is everything that we do is an aspect of our service of God, of that spiritual connection to God. So looking again, looking back at Kohala, where you've got all these stories and kingship and oppression and you've got uh, struggle, and you've got happiness, and you've got gathering wealth, and you've got, he had, a, he had um, we saw, I think it was in the seventh chapter, eighth chapter, somewhere like that, he had a, a investment advice, you know, how to invest. All these things are inherently godly, because they are all relate to our connection with God. God brings everything into his judgment. Again, the word judgment not being a negative connotation. Judgment being a connection to God, I'll call now on everything that you forgot, that I forgot. Right? How many things do we, you know, somebody tells us, you know, you had, remember we had this conversation two years ago? Like, no, no recollection of this at all. He doesn't forget those things. Now there's good things and there's bad things, right? There's things that we are proud of and there's things that we're not necessarily proud of, but all of those things are a connection to God. They're all a way that we relate to God in some way because these things are going on. God is listening. He is being feared and he, his commandments are being kept. And in other words, everything that goes on, everything that we've seen is a, is a piece of that relationship. So the final kind of hammer blow to, to the book of Kohelet is that everything that we've discussed is in fact spiritual. So while we've taken a, an approach, our approach to the book has been explicitly uh, physical, tachad hashemesh, that everything is talk, has been discussing how to achieve things and gain things in this world, it is in and of itself a spiritual endeavor. Okay, so I think that's really the main idea, and so and that's that's clear by the way from the fact that what's being brought to judgment is both good and bad. You don't need to bring good to judgment necessarily. Right, must be judgment is something beyond just the English word judgment. Right, mishpat is this other uh, all-encompassing relationship. So, um, with that, congratulations. <laughs> we have finished the book of Kohelet. Okay. Yes. Right, steam, steam. Steam. Right. Thank you, Robert. Right. Interesting. I like that. I have to think about that. Some more. So Steve is saying, I don't know if you can hear on the thing. So Steve is saying, Steve My Roberts um, is saying over here that the beginning of the entire process was Hevel. Hevel. And that's co- come consistently. And so we've been talking about Hevel as being Really, the word Hevel means steam, S-T-E-A-M, steam. Um, and the fact that Hevel, whenever he refers to something as Hevel, it doesn't that simply mean that it is, um, what are the words they always use? Uh, futile, futile. It's not futile, right? Vanity, right? It's that it's some, Hevel is something that is generally, you're right, you can't get anything out of it. You can't capture steam. But if you've got the tools and you know what to do, you can actually figure out how to distill it and turn it into water. Or you could power a train through it or a steamboat or you know, it has its own power. So Hevel is always things, he always talks about Hevel as things 
that are um, on face value, and in most circumstances, they have no purpose. <clears throat> but in reality, if you know what you're doing, if you have the wisdom, you're going to be able to distill something uh, powerful out, out of it. So uh, Steve is saying how the Hevel is something that is, is physical, but it's made ethereal, basically. It, it leaves the spiritual, the physical realm. It turns, it, water turns into steam, and then it dissipates into the air. And here we have kind of the opposite, where we've got everything physical, or I guess not the opposite, it's really kind of the same idea, is that everything physical is really spiritual in nature. So I like that idea. It's kind of full circle. Now we come back to the beginning of the book again, and we see everything being listed as Hevel. It means that it's it got a spiritual list to it. It's got an ethereal uh, factor to it. So I, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. I like that a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So that's what, okay. So the way Steve is putting it is that you have something that is ethereal. It is through the physical, it's distilled. We, we, we turn it into something physical, but then it comes back around as the ethereal again. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's what you were saying the first time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so excited. This has really been great. Um, I really appreciate that, uh, uh, all of you um, who have all who have all come in. Some of you are are uh, are are longtime sufferers, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know. But we and some people kind of come in and out. And uh, I appreciate all of you coming, and it's really been really been fun. I'm I'm hoping to come up with something else. I've been racking my brain for the right the right mm -hmm. material um, because not everything lends itself as well as Kohelet. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what it is. I don't want to leave you high and dry. So I, uh, yeah, Shir Shirim is interesting though because it's. I was thinking about that. Shir Shirim is a narrative, is a story. So you really have to discuss the story and then the allegory, you know, uh, which there is. There, there is some. There, there are commentaries that do that. Um, sorry, I just have a note here. Yes, uh, I'm not sure who NP is, but you're right. King and Michelle? okay. Uh, King 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 Solomon did not actually. Again, we we discussed this early, earlier. King Solomon, according to the sages' interpretation, King Solomon was not a sinner in his own right. He did not do any sins himself. He did not do as the verse states. He did not serve the idols themselves. He just didn't do anything about it, and that's why it kind of got tacked onto his account. Um, that being said, uh, the verses put it that way. So. The way the verses have it is that he did the sin. So, yes, he didn't do the sin according to the the tradition, but he he did. It, if you just read the verse as it is, it would definitely seem that way. And the verse was likely written for a purpose in order to give you that vibe, I guess, <laughs> that he did that. Okay, uh, again, thank you for everyone on the on the uh, um, on the Zoom. Uh, sorry, you couldn't make it in person, but we got a whole bunch of people here. This is again. If we, if we got these numbers every week, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so, and yeah, yeah, unfortunately, you guys, here in, in person, we have some scotch. So, uh,